Good evening. I am one of the programmers of the festival, Maria Reinop, and I'm here with Michal Kolar. And uh, we are in the verge of an evening for his uh, first uh, feature film, The Red Captain, to premiere here at Black Knights Film Festival in the first film competition. And it's my absolute pleasure to have you. Your past and background is actually very producer oriented. Maybe open up a little bit and tell what you've done before. Yeah. Um, so basically, it's a coincidence because. Uh, I always been a director, and mm, I partnered up with uh, with a similar, similarly oriented uh, another director, dear friend of mine, Victor Tausch, and we sort of were very frustrated that nobody wanted to produce our films. We were quite established uh, commercial directors in the mid two uh, thousands, let's say, uh, and. Uh, we were bringing the scripts to the production companies that, that we were shooting commercials for, like, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody was really interested. They all have the ambition, but uh, they don't really want to do the effort. So we took the risk and we sort of founded our own production company and we produced uh, or co-produced our own pictures. And and soon enough, it was quite clear that uh, all the all of the directorial knowledge that we have and frustration can be used also another very positive way, way and that is to produce somebody else's work. So this is how it really started. So our first official production of somebody else's work was uh, uh, The House of Susanna Leova. It uh, premiered in a forum uh, in Berlin. Yes, and uh, it's been the first Slovak directed uh, feature after 20 years to be in Berlin in some sort of a section. So it was a huge success. We won numerous Academy Awards, uh, local Academy Awards, and it also won Palfrings and many other like festivals. It was the most successful festival-wise uh, film uh, in recent Czech Slovak history, certainly around 2011. Mm -hmm. And so this is how it started. And then we got uh, really adventurous, actually. To, to orient more towards, uh, towards uh, interesting co-productions, which uh, our usual countries of co-productions are either Poland, maybe, maybe Hungary. Uh, for some established producers of Prague, it's usually Germany. Yeah. And we ventured north to Finland and, and more west than west itself, and it's Luxembourg. <laughs> so we also managed to do our first, uh, the first uh, Czech, Slovak, Luxembourgish, Finnish co-production. Uh, co and and uh, so this is basically what we are known for, to do uh, seemingly difficult co-productions, but always uh, it's directed by, it's, it's uh, dictated by a director or script or or some historical consequences or historical material. Uh, so it needs to be warranted, it's not producer's calculation. Yeah. So this is, this is, yeah, so this is what we do. And with my film, uh, Red Captain, it was similar coincidence that I really wanted to work with a certain Polish DOP. He hasn't done the film at the end, it's a different guy, but we managed to co-produce from Czech and Slovak standpoint his debut, yeah. his name is Marcin Koshalka and the film is Red Spider of. So it's a coincidence, Red Captain, Red Spider, it has nothing to do, it's just maybe some higher, a higher sign uh, that we've done two red movies, as we call them. And this film uh, was also very successful uh, artistic-wise. Um, it, it premiered in Karlovy Vary and it travels well, festival-wise, and it has good reviews. And uh, this brought us basically very or organically to, to, to Polish co-production because I, because I always wanted Polish DOP and I wanted for the main character, I wanted some unknown yet very experienced actor. Mm. And that means to look around surrounding countries to to maybe have their locally known actor, but uh, for our purposes, he's, he's unknown. Now he's very well known because of the popularity of the film, I'm very happy to say. So basically, this is our background as producers. And, and by the same token, we we are sort of, I, I, half jokingly, I say that we are paying for our own film school by producing uh, other, other work of established directors, such as Jan Grzebejk. Uh, we produced uh, his film Honeymoon, yeah, yeah. very successful yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's traveled really, really well. It was well attended as well. And currently we are doing back-to-back, uh, -back, basically, a trilogy of his films. So 
it's another lecture for us as uh, as filmmakers. So it's very interesting. Uh, it feels to me that you have just taken the matter in your hands. Like from the frustration as a director not being able to make your stories, you've just kind of gone and done it yourself. And that's one of the ways that you can kind of survive. And I feel that a lot of people in the art house scenery here don't really do that. Um, but you've somehow made this formula. And I think Red Captain also is a little bit of formula film. You've put together a great DOP. You've put together not only a great lead cast, but there's a lot of more good actors in it. It's not only Stuart, it's, there, there's a whole ensemble of great faces. Was that planned also from the beginning as within your clever thinking or it came along later? Uh, it basically came along because um, as you mentioned, really they are in the very minor roles, whatever the, the, the role of a junkie, um, there is a Academy Award winner, a Czech Academy Award winner for acting, which I even didn't think as, as such, but I came even to apologize to him that it's a, such a small role, almost like an extra, but he had a lot of fun and he was like, okay, why not? Let's have a party, let's shoot it. So it wasn't a, really a calculation, it just came that, that way because um, actor of a certain quality sort of a, attracts or needs a counterpart of a certain quality, so it wasn't like me putting it to an Excel table yeah. and calculating it. Um, but uh, needless to say that that uh, we were, if there is anything brave, and I really needed to be a little bit pushed toward this uh, direction, uh, is casting of uh, comedians in uh, certain roles of uh, very bad guys or very uh, sneaky, convoluted guys, and they are really known for doing this low-level, actually, comedy on private TV, very popular, a lot of money for them, a lot of, su lot of success, let's say. Amen. Yeah, like a like middle-class success because they are on TV five days a week, like doing silly stuff. So I'm very proud that uh, they, they took the role and they were brave, brave enough because they are, of course, mm -hmm. trained actors, but uh, they were brave, brave enough to, uh, to, to take a risk because they really don't need it. And they even told me so, or one of them actually told me so very honestly, like, you know, I, yeah, okay, fine, but I don't really need this. You understand yeah. that, that I don't need this, so I am really... Uh, I am scared to do it, and I was pushing him. No, no, no! You need to do it. It will be great. So, and this this remind me basically. Speaking of homages, this re really reminded me, like for instance, Jean Pierre Melville when he cast Bourville in uh, Red Circle with Alain Delon, and I did, I used it as an argument. He didn't know really the our actor, but what, what, yeah, what I was still, what I was talking about. But I was like, okay, there was a there a couple of instances like. Uh, uh, in history of certainly like noir or neo-noir films uh, or, or cop dramas then were really casting of, uh, of uh, really underrated uh, comedian, comedian in a very serious role worked and, and, and for some instance I was really using this red circle with Delon as, a, as an example a lot, a lot of times and it worked of course because Okay, I need to rewatch it. Uh, who is that? And uh, <laughs> which role? And yeah, and so so all of a sudden they are taking it that we are on the same level. Okay, <laughs> which is nice. But I have to still go back to the formula because it feels to me that the fact that the script is based on a actually quite uh, well sold uh, crime novel is also not just there for you know by accident. That is that your own personal interest? You read a lot, or again you mathematically which does sound a bit negative, but I don't mean it that way. It's just very much planned that there's already some base interest for the film, just like that. Uh, it started really personally because I uh, was always uh, steering towards this material. I'm, all of my like am amateur videos when I was 16, 17, so on, were in this genre, of mm -hmm. course, silly ones. Uh, and I never... I wrote a couple of scripts that were like yeah, cool crime this, crime that, dramas, uh, whatever, even comedy dramas, and they read well, but of course, once again, nobody wanted to make them. And all of a sudden, I I noticed uh, this guy, this up and rising Slovak uh, uh, writer, Dominic Dan, uh, and I noticed him in a very commercial way uh, because he was the only one, or one of the few, I should say now, you know, of the Slovak authors that has his own poster in the bookstores when the new book is released. So it's very 
very bottom line kind of, kind of instinct. And once I started to read the books at that time, there were only 13, I think, of them. I really become interested because he was writing about the places in, in, uh, in Bratislava that I knew very well. He's older uh, than, than I am. He's an experienced crime uh, homicide investigator. Basically, the main hero, Kraus, is his alter ego. But nevertheless, uh, I, from the get-go, I thought like, wow, this gives me the justification to do a local genre because, look, it's based on a well-sold book, so I'm not that crazy to do a genre film. But it was actually really harder than anything else because this kind of thinking from the commercial standpoint ha uh, there were another two well-established old older I should say producers that grabbed the book from the get-go purely basis on on uh, on the sales okay so it was very hard from I was the third one I think in uh, yeah I was the third one in line so it was very hard uh, coming it wasn't e it was easy to talk to the author because oh look I know the places I remember the poster I remember the street I remember the building from the 90s so he was sold okay but it was very hard to to sort of beat these established guys let's say that uh, talking to the film funds, talking to the so, uh, Slovak television or, or many other like uh, distributors because they were always like each year and this has been going on uh, for four years, okay? Like they kept telling me, okay, uh, we got enough Dominic dance, there is a TV series in works, there is another feature and, and they are further ahead and of course they weren't at the end, so we were the first. But I really spent like five years of our four years of my life listening only to this and then we managed to put together the co-production and, and, and the, trick, tri yeah, the trick was to, to I am one of the author of, authors of the script with two other screenwriters, it was a tough adaptation because the book really, as it should, the book really doesn't make sense. So <laughs> I, once again, I was thinking, okay, so uh, I used the, the Melville example and now the book doesn't make sense. So now we are in a, a Raymond Chandler, a big sleep, sort of a Howard Hawks territory. It doesn't need to make sense, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we may, yeah. 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 yeah, so this was another reasoning behind it. So. Uh, we really restructured the book to, and I guarantee to make uh, the sense. And and our our or my screenwriter Miro Shifra, he really brought it home, as they say. And and he was digging into true life archive, archives of a former Communist Secret Service, their cooperation with the Catholic Church. So actually, those real life elements, not the half fiction elements of the book really tied it for, uh, for us because as much as I love Dominic Dan, this book was like a Da Vinci code uh, that's, a, that's a secret that, that uh, there is still a, in Slovakia there is like a huge or quite furious uh, uh, Facebooking going on about it either if, if it hurt the film or if it was better for the film oh. but it was literally hunting the Templar treasure Hidden by a comedy secret service, blah blah. It's actually it's based on a true, true. It's inspired by a true some of file of former comedy secret service, but but um, not as cool, by the way. But uh, <laughs> but we we knew from the get go. This is the first thing. This is the first storyline that that has to go because otherwise, not only we are third in line, but but everybody knows this Hollywood whatever adaptation yeah. so so <laughs> so uh, everybody would accuse us that we are completely crazy now that would be a calculation so we we used to, uh, I, I tend to joke that we used one third of the book the first 150 pages and 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 then some cool scenes from uh, from the from the rest of the book so actually there is a lot of the book but uh, mostly those are of course it's the main character and the, the the characters of the the, the policemen, but it's uh, it's the set pieces that that uh, we are sort of tying together. Did uh, Dominic get to read later the script version where you only had you know put a lo large chunk of the beginning of the book and then pieces because some author might not be very you know uh, too welcoming about these ideas? Did you have a good collaboration later? Uh, we had a I, I, we had a great collaboration uh, at the beginning. He thought that he would be involved more, but uh, he makes uh, his fortune and his success by writing books and really has yeah so 
know, they and it's a sort of experience with the writers, by the way, they always think that uh, that they will be, in our countries, uh, that they will be involved with the script, but it's really hard work, daily work, quarter of a year, half a year, eight months, really writing, and it's not that um, monetary, monetarily satisfactory, so, 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 so our first, or after one year of basically nothing happening, he was like, okay, so w when do you think uh, we're gonna, you, something is gonna happen? And I was quite honest, I said like four to six years. And I was betting on four, and then it was six. And was a top uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, and he was like, why, I, 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 I will write uh, another 12 novels, and he did. In the meantime, he wrote another 10 novels with this main character, like making, I don't know how many, uh, how many readers, uh, attracting how many readers in the process, but, but uh, uh, every version I sort of send it to him and he was more frustrated with the other projects not picking up, so for a long time the entire community of uh, Slovak filmmakers were a bunch of like idiots for him because he naturally he didn't understand, but, but yeah. then, then, then he's very, very happy about the, the adaptation, I think. You really have to uh, pick a right book because, or a novel, because if the author of it can move forward with another ten while you're still trying to make yeah. the same one, you gotta really like, you know, the the content of it. Otherwise, you feel already that it's, you know, somewhere in the past, and yes. that hasn't happened, as I understand. No, this this, uh, the, this is maybe a bit uh, more answers the question about the uh, the thing being calculated on on our part or on my part, uh, as a genre film, uh, and I see it a lot around. Our countries, if it's set in the past, it's sort of a, it's cemented, and it allows to director. Uh, sh I shouldn't say that, but it allows the director to to sort of a show off and to do the genre things. Yeah. Okay, because it's set in the past, it's based on some sort of a truth or or some sort of reality. So we are allowed to do that. If we would do a, the the if we would attempt to do the same in a present time. It would be silly, and I think the film wouldn't get financed unless it once again sort of pretends to be it on a more serious uh, note of the yeah. recent political climate or whatever. It always needs to sort of masquerade itself. We cannot just make a John Wick, okay? <laughs> because that would be uh, unfinanceable, or and, and it would seem silly. Yeah. Okay, so so I'm just okay. I'm saying this like uh, as a genre fan that the, maybe soon enough like. One day somebody will make a purely genre film coming from, let's say, Central, Eastern Europe, uh, of some crime drama that, that will resonate purely on its basis of a well-done genre and it doesn't need to be a book or this and that. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I'm not happy about everything, yeah. but... But, I mean, talking about genre, I feel really that, that there's difficulties to make genre. It's difficult for young uh, filmmakers to come to the field and try to pitch their genre ideas and get them made in the first place. And particularly here in Estonia, it doesn't happen almost at all. And how, how is the situation for you? Like, uh, is it, do you see around you that it's not being made and that, that made the whole process also harder, as I understand already now from the short talk? Well, uh, let's say in uh, Slovakia, there are uh, a Czech Republic and Slovakia. They are, as I said, they are always trying to masquerade their attempts that this is based on a true story of a famous mobster in the early nineties. There's a very successful uh, film like that, uh, or we are trying to comment, or we are trying to illustrate that once again. Uh, this very famous case from the mid uh, '90s again. Yeah. So this is really the the only way to go. And and of course they really want to make a cool, f cool film more or less successfully, uh, mm, a genre film. But they need to declare that uh, oh yeah we are we are basically conserving the parts of history. Okay. Yeah. So this is the mascot. It's funny to me. It's and and format, yeah yeah yeah. And so so everybody does it. Uh, uh, in Poland, uh, also like the, the because of the the budgets, because I know a little bit about Poland, I dare to say. So all of the uh, well done stuff, uh, either is like history, all of it is basically like historical sort of event, uh, so, and they masquerade it even as an action film, you know, or the action film is masqueraded as a as a important historical event film. Besides the one crazy musical. Did you see that police film yeah. about two sisters who are mermaids, no. killer, killer mermaids? All right, you've missed out one Polish uh, genre film, yeah. I will. 
But talking about uh, genre films, I feel that there's a lot of elements that you really know that your handwriting in some way. I was surprised that, of course, I could bring up uh, True Detective like uh, influence uh, mentioned here, but that's not my interest. I I saw Seven and some other. Uh, is that like I hear you're a genre fan, something that you also knew from the beginning that you want to have a little bit of tribute and so forth, or I'm I'm, I'm just a, as another genre fan seeing them in the film. Um. I would go beyond, uh, the, the problem with True Detective is that it really caught us short, all of us, because it came out really mid-shoot, uh, mid right? And uh, if anything, we had a problem to talk to the advertising uh, guys and the graphic designer guys doing the posters. Everybody wanted to do the opening titles from the true yeah, through, through yeah. detective, it was all over. I said like, no, I don't want to see another head made of the collage of the city with the eyes. Uh, it's cool, it works, but the, to me it's silly. Of course, the other guys done it, and okay, good for them, but I really didn't want this, so mm -hmm. we went a different way. We got, that's the poster. And speaking of the inspiration, of course, you cannot really escape, escape, uh, 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 seven and the Silence of the Lambs, I should say, more even because Silence of the Lambs uh, for me is the first sort of a thriller that I really, really, uh, s that I saw in cinema and, and it really spoke to me as a thriller and it was the, it was the dolly, it was the dolly shots for me, for instance, I was 13 or whatever, 14 years old and it was the, it, a moving camera, it was, uh, yeah, so the, the, each film sort of a, you remember something from, but that mentioning the seven, seven is collage or, or, or Fincher, what he does, it's basically, uh, uh, it's Polanski <laughs> all the way. I mean, it's, 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 uh, uh, it's Polanski and, and, and in more than one way. So for me, it was Sorry. more, yeah, yeah. So for me, it was also, and Jean-Pierre Melvin, as I mentioned him, uh, uh, for me, it was like more of a Polanski and, and the coins, uh, coins. They say that uh, you, should, you should carry, or, or if you prefer to work this way, you should carry one film or two films only uh, with you once you are doing yours. And for me, it was no country for old men, not the seven. Because seven, I knew from every perspective. I own every possible grading version of it, so uh, uh, naturally the influence is there. While writing the film, I was listening to the soundtrack of Seven all the time. Uh, but it, but it's dangerous. But then again, I was also uh, half and half. I was listening also to the Ninth Gate. Let's say yeah. uh, while writing. I'm, I'm, but I'm talking like three and a half years, listening only to this. Yeah, and, and speaking of seven, it's, it's Polanski and it's the 70s American paranoia thrillers. The main motive, uh, and he is a dear friend, our music composer, Petro Ostrocho, but the main motive is from the temp track of The Marathon Man. Basically, the, the little piano. You really have done your homework. I like it. <laughs> uh, it's Clute, Clute and Marathon Man. Yeah. There is another two soundtracks that were used constantly while editing the film. So. Uh, I am going to use this rare chance. Like, if you had to now list, like, uh, ten films or soundtracks, uh, um, art pieces, so forth, that have been really like crucially uh, important to you throughout the times for young people, uh, filmmakers, genre lovers out there, what they would be? Uh, from 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 films. Uh, uh, many of them. Let's let's start with the 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 old ones. Of course, it's basically every every Hitchcock ever made, even the stupid ones, the the comedy one, the early yeah, ones. Okay. Sneaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, uh, you 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 have to watch Hitchcock to to sort of uh, get the gist of it. So from the Hitchcock, it would be North by Northwest because of the of its sort of a comedy comedy elements. And, uh, and uh, uh, then there is uh, uh, Silence of the Lambs, of course, Seven, of course. Uh, it's must seize, of course, it's, it's Chinatown. Uh, uh, that, that's a must, but uh, from l lesser known uh, Polanski films, of course, it's Repulsion. And uh, The Tenant. Mm. The Tenant, if anything, how to shoot, because we are, the Tenant is interesting for us because Polanski has this, because maybe he has it in his mind and he thinks from reality, not from seeing other movies, but it's like shooting in the apartments. It sounds silly, but the Rosemary's Baby, Tenant and everything, the, the, there's the precision of shooting 
in the door, two, two three people talking, uh, yeah, control, yeah, control the small, yes, 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 and, and it's always spectacular and, 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 and seemingly it seems like boring, but it's not, it's like perfectly calculated, so, and then there is Melville, basically all of them, um, and uh, oh, and very important. It's uh, two two films from Kurosawa, the early ones, uh, uh, the mid ones, not the early ones. Uh, Stray Dog and Drunken Angel. Stray Stray Dog was very much an inspiration, and I should say that publicly uh, for the guys sweating so nicely, so because the Stray Dog is a black and white film. So, uh, uh, set in Tokyo of the 40s, so everything is like bombarded and in the ghetto of Tokyo, afterward Tokyo, yeah. and and it's black and white, and it's interesting how it works with the audience visually to remind the heat. So it's the, the film opens with the dog who, with his tongue out, like almost dying from the heat, and from the get, and it's the only opening titles, and it even gets worse, people are always standing in front of the ventilators, and, and Toshiro Mifune is, always has sweat, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, you can feel that, and it's a black, and, it's a, it's a black and white film. So, so that that one be very much of an inspiration. And once again, it's very, it's it's the pre precision of the shooting. Some would say even with Fincher that it's technocratic, but he can do that. Be uh, so does Polanski and, and these huge guys because he has the acting. Yeah. You can do or coins. You can have it, but you need to have the hundred percent acting. Precision. Yeah, the yeah. Video. Because the actors give you the emotion and the truth because nowadays everybody, everything is possible. I can take the camera and do whatever, the motion control, track it in my After Effects. So it's not that interesting anymore. Yeah. But, but the acting and, and the story always would be, it's a cliche to say, but, but from the soundtrack, it's certainly, uh, let's, uh, soundtrack, yeah, it's, it's certainly Clute, uh, Clute and Marathon Man and All Presidents Man. Uh, they are they are really paranoid. It's, it's the marathon man, especially the piano. I mean, that's really par parano paranoia to me. And um, the the ninth gate from which uh, from Killar, and and of course uh, it's a mass. It's very melodic. It's two Hovershore soundtracks. One is for Seven, and the the other one is for for Silence of the Lambs. The Seven is interesting. We tried it, but it uh, it gets to your nerve. It gets to your nerve by a very clever idea of never finishing the movement. It's always mmm, mmm, and it goes up and up and never finishes the entire film. So it keeps the audience very nervous. Yeah, and is, there is never release. Because in Hollywood score, Silence of the Lambs has it, but, but, uh, but, but uh, a normal Hollywood score would have this like crescendo and, and ending, either be the murder or winning of the main hero, but this doesn't have it, so it's very clever. Yeah, the sad truth is that we have to have an ending. Yes. This is, this is the sad truth. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> I love that this, uh, this uh, small interview to talk about your film turned into like a little study on, on great films of history. I, I hope that the audience enjoy your film tonight. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. I will uh, recommend you to anyone who wants to talk about great movies and great times with great movies. Thank <laughs> you.